Hey folks, David Stewart here. Hope you guys are having a fantastic Wednesday. It's time for the right stream. Today we're going to talk about developing as a writer. Um, this is one of the bigger things I focused on when I wrote this book, which you can actually get, um, you could buy it, or it's actually free, I think, with almost all the tiers, other than just like the Discord only tier of Patreon. Keys to Prolific Creativity. A big chunk of this is dedicated to basically how to practice, right? A lot of lessons that I learned as a musician, um, <laughs> lessons that I learned um, with fitness, all that stuff applies to writing in ways that a lot of people don't quite realize. Uh, and one of the big differences between, say, like a, a good writer and a bad writer, or maybe let's say a professional and an amateur, is just the amount of practice that the good writer has. There's an old saying like, the master has failed more times than the novice has tried. Uh, and the fact is that most writers vastly underestimate the amount of practice they need before they're able to do their craft really well. If you are dedicated and you are working hard and you are, you know, um, writing every day and you're getting feedback, and you're approaching everything critically. Maybe you can get to a good level, presentable level, after writing about maybe a half million words, 500,000 words. More realistic is probably a million words. And this was suggested by a friend of mine who I've had on the channel numerous times. I need to have him on maybe next week. Um, we were gonna do like a monthly retro stream thing. So I need to just like make that a monthly thing because it was pretty fun. Anyway, uh, what Brian says is that it, you have to get the suck out and it usually takes about a million words, meaning you just, you have to do the reps. <laughs> just like going into the gym and lifting, you're not gonna build muscle without like lifting weights. You're not gonna get good at writing without doing the writing portion. It's not just reading, like reading is important, obviously, but like you need to write as well. You need to exercise. Uh, because you won't be able to quite realize how the what you've read translates into something that you someone else should read, someone else should read until you've done the writing yourself. So you know, realistically, a million words. Put that into perspective. If you're writing a thousand words a day, which is a, a fairly manageable goal for most people that are busy, um, you know, you're looking at maybe two years of practice before you're getting to a place where you're going to be. Uh, good enough where things are going to be good enough to publish and you're not going to be writing things that suck. That's not that long when you think about it. You know, people take four year degrees in creative writing and get out at the end of it and still suck. And I think the reason is because they just haven't done enough writing. Uh, they've taken a lot of inputs. They haven't really managed their influences and then they just kind of think that they just do something it'll be good because they took a seminar from some writer who had written books that they thought were good you know what i mean so you know you have to do the practice um so a lot of this book is really dedicated to how do you get practice done like what does it mean to do that how do you arrange your life so that you're able to get the reps in to improve as a writer and what um this isn't dealt with specifically in the novel but you know it's part of having a growth mindset um but what does it mean to be a developing writer? And how should you feel if you are still developing as a writer? So I wanna talk about some of those things today. Um, if you're looking at like all of the, all the keys that are in here, there's only like nine different areas. Um, you know, uh, one of them is really just like the, you know, the growth mindset. I have a whole chapter on that. Um, you know, there's no standing still. You're either getting better or like your skills are decaying and Maybe sometimes you're standing still, but usually you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And that's true with your instrument, if you're if you're a guitar player or you're a trumpet player or something, and it's gonna be true with your um, with your writing craft. So this is something that I think a lot of people need to internalize and get used to this idea. I would say the, the bad things that I've seen in the world of writing, and I've talked about them a little bit on my Substack, and I think I'll link the newest Substack because it's about Unicorn Overlord. So this is a great way to um, to transition into that. 
Unicorn Overlord is a game that I was really excited about, not just because the name is super awesome, uh, but because the gameplay was really awesome. But it had really bad dialogue, like really bad dialogue. And the dialogue was mostly the result of the localization team. Uh, taking, well, let's say a lot of liberties with the translation, but uh, really doing kind of Mad Lib style writing. And um, the truth about the Mad Lib style writing is that it just wasn't good. Um, it, it reeked to me of somebody who was still what I would call a developing writer. That means somebody who is new to the craft, who hasn't done a lot of practice, who just hasn't, hasn't been around doing it. Um, if you haven't done it a few times if you haven't written something and gone back and looked at it or had another person look at it later when you have a clear mind to say like oh, this is bad and i know i can understand why this is bad then you're going to write bad things and be oblivious to it it's kind of like the dunning kruger effect of writers is that uh, new writers think everything they write is just like you know gold they think they're crapping out gold now the truth is like uh it's going to be bad and that's why to say hey you finished your first book great take it put it in a drawer leave it there for like a year come back to it after a year and you're going to see all the problems that you didn't see when you were writing it partially because you're in that creative space you're working the ideas are flowing you're excited about it and you're excited about everything you're doing the other reason is because you will grow as a writer and then you'll come back and look at it and be like oh man those were some really maybe this was a good idea but this was a really weird idea and this was not a good idea and this didn't work and this is cringy or bad dialogue is the big one okay dialogue um thinking of like unicorn overlord you can absolutely tank a story with bad dialogue uh readers will skip purple prose they generally don't skip dialogue this is from elmore leonard um he pointed this out many years ago and it's and it's true so your dialogue knowing how people speak it can really tank something and that's what happened with unicorn overlord is like it was a rewrite it was basically a rewrite by un by writers who weren't talented um now i'm saying not talented i should say probably like developing writers how do developing writers get this gig well it's a translation gig not a writing gig so people aren't thinking about having to be good at something you know they're thinking about uh it's an opportunity for me to try to stretch my writing chops and it's like you haven't written a million words of, of suck yet you haven't written the million words to figure out how to write how to take a, a simple Japanese statement, look at a simple translation and idiomatize it, like turn it into correct English idioms, make it seem realistic like an English speaker would speak it. That takes some writing chops, it really does. And the fact is they don't have any, right? They haven't done, they clearly haven't done the work. So if you just get a job in a, like doing a localization, um, it's really easy to just do a terrible job because you haven't done the work, you just haven't done the practice. This also leads me to another hypothesis that a lot of the garbage of wokeness is just a low skill issue. Like the, one of the reasons Force Awakens sucks is not because it is uh, it is like woke. Like, you know, people talk about Ray being woke and stuff. It's just that, you know, um, the writers involved in it, including um, Jar Jar Abrams, are just bad. They just aren't good at what they do. It's a skill issue. Um, because you can write stuff that's like leftist and not make it bad if you have high skill and plenty of other artists have done so so why does it suck with star wars it sucks because it's just people who i don't know they're just not good they haven't they haven't done the work i guess to do it and if, to put it in perspective like a, a screenplay i would if i'm going to equate like a screenplay to a book like how many screenplays do i have to write to get the reps in for a book i would say to if you're looking at a hundred thousand word book you need to write like five screenplays to get the equivalent of that hundred thousand words because that's how many words you're going to end up writing in the screenplay it's a lot less there's a lot less writing that goes into writing a screenplay than writing a book um i know that that might not be popular with screenwriters but the the reality is it takes a lot less skill to write a screenplay than it does to write a book and i know because i've written both and screenplays are way easier and quicker to write because there's just less writing to do it's all dialogue and, but the 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 fact is that if the dialogue sucks in the screenplay, it's going to suck in the book too. So both of them have dialogue and you have to be good at it. So you got to you gotta spend some time doing a lot of writing before 
you figure out what sucks. The benefit is if you are uh, doing producing screenplays, you can hear actors say the lines and you'd be like, oh, maybe that does sound bad. You get a little bit more feedback on whether your dialogue sucks, right? Uh, George Lucas was getting pegged for bad dialogue like after he had written who knows how many screenplays and drafts of stuff, right? So it takes a long time to just like be good at writing dialogue. You need a lot of practice for it, right? Uh, Johnny Boy SP says it's unfortunately a common occurrence for JRPG localization to be full of novice or failed writers who don't realize the end product provided is glorified fan fiction. Now, I'm not sure if they don't realize it, but they certainly don't realize that it's bad, right? It's fan fiction. Like if they hired me to do it, it would be good because I'm good. And I've written 20 some odd books or something, right? I've done a lot of work um, and I've worked with a lot of people over the years. Like if they hired me to do it, then it probably... If they'd be like, here's our script. Can you just make it not suck? I'd be like, absolutely. And then I'd be like, okay, um, keep it simple, stupid. Why did you take this Japanese sentence that was like, farewell, and you wrote like a big, a bunch of garbage about sand through the hourglass? It's like, this is stupid. Cut that out and just write farewell. Keep it simple, stupid. Dialogue doesn't have to be fussy. In fact, it's better if it's not. And even purple prose, most people don't prefer it. They'll skip the prose and get to the dialogue. If the dialogue is too florid then it's just it's going to put people off after a while they're just they'd be like you're, you're spending a lot of words saying nothing and you have to think about how do people actually talk <laughs> would if somebody says farewell would you say a bunch of things or would you just be like bye <coughs> sorry you'd probably just say bye so you have to think about you know you have to think about how that's going to work with real people and it was clear to me looking at unicorn overlord that um yeah, they just were developing writers. They didn't know how bad it was, or they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have said they were proud of it. Like the the person uh, who was in charge of the project, like, I'm so proud of what we did. It's like uh, I'm looking at what you did, and it's not something I would be proud to have done. But it's probably because you haven't spent enough time practicing that you don't realize how bad it is. Okay. Uh, well, you do have to be able to critique your own work honestly if you want to be good at any creative pursuit. And that's another problem with like why woke is a skill issue is that uh, most of these people are either covert or just uh, like grandiose narcissists. If they're in the media, they're like a grandiose narcissist. Uh, but they may otherwise be like a covert narcissist. And so they're, uh, you know, they're not going to be honest about their own skill level and they're going to be hostile to anyone telling them that like, this is really bad and you shouldn't have done this. And uh, it sounds awkward and people are going to not like it. It's like, what? Um, they they want to be insular about that sort of thing. So it's unfortunate because you could take a great game made by Vanillaware and tank it. Because let's be honest, the story is a big part of the game. And so if the writing is bad in the story, then a huge portion of the game is going to be unenjoyable because of how bad the dialogue is. So no one's under any obligation to pay 60 or $70 for a game where a huge portion of the game is going to not be fun because of the bad dialogue. There's other games I can point to, too. One of them is Triangle Strategy. has one of the worst, probably has the worst dialogue I've ever seen in a game and one of the worst stories and one of the worst expositions for a story that I've ever experienced in any medium. Triangle Strategy is a bad game, even though the combat is pretty good. I would say Triangle Strategy is like a D game because of how bad the story is. Um, and that's another Japanese localization issue, right? Uh, partly that, but even if it had been a good translation, I, I would still knock the story down low. It's not a good story. It's really just not a very good story at all. Um, but the localization certainly doesn't help things. Um, but it's, a you know, like, oh, what? but shouldn't we support games that have the gameplay we want? Well... I don't think anyone's under any obligation to buy a game that they're not going to enjoy because it kind of uses elements like you're like you're trying to send a sixty dollars signal to people. The the truth is it's a joint product, right? And so the eight four I think was the localization team on Unicorn Overlord. If you buy a copy of Unicorn Overlord, you're sending the signal that the entire product is worth sixty dollars, not that the gameplay and the art is worth sixty dollars by Vanillaware and the translation is worth zero dollars. The company's just going to hire those same borked bad writers again to mess up the next game because they don't speak English, right? They're relying on a localization team to make it palatable for English audiences because they happen to be Japanese. That's the whole point. That's why you hire someone is so that you don't have to go and learn English. Uh, but yeah, they're just going to do that again. So the signal is not going to come clear in any way. The only way I guess would be to like 
order it from Japan, which someone suggested on Twitter, like get the Japanese version with no localization. Like it's not on there. But even then it's like they already paid them. You know, they have the localizers have no skin in the game. They don't lose the money out of their bank account when they do a bad job. Though I guess you know, if a company really wanted to sue them for doing a bad job, they maybe could, but I I doubt it. Because they it's their responsibility to quality check it. You know what I mean? Like if Sega really wanted to make it right, if Atlas wanted to make it right, they would just hire they would hire another team to redo all of the dialogue. It wouldn't even be that expensive, but because you could do it for way cheap with people that know what they're doing. But um, they're never going to do that because they're just never going to do that. So you're just going to have a bad translation forever. It's never going to come out on PC because VanillaWare doesn't release PC games. And they said they have no plan to release this one on PC. So you're never going to mod it. You're never going to be able to mod it with a better fan translation. Your only option for experiencing the story in a non-annoying bad writing way is to just learn Japanese that's you know most people don't have time to just learn a foreign language for a game but we're kind of at the point where maybe we all just need to learn Japanese you know I know a little bit of Japanese I've studied it a little bit it'd be good to know it better so maybe this is just maybe we all just need to be like okay the way that we're going to avoid this is we're only going to buy crap from Japan directly and the English people can die in a horse fire or whatever, right? They can die. <laughs> we just won't support them um, at all. Um, and people will wonder why things sell so well in Japan. There's like more copies shipping out of Japan than there are people in Japan. It's like, yeah, everyone, we learn we learn Japanese. But most people are not going to do that. They're just going to sit through the bad fan fiction um, and the people who suck are going to keep getting work because they, they don't have any skin again. They don't have any skin in the game and they have no feedback. And they're never going to do the reps required. They're never going to write like four books in order to figure out how to write so that they can not suck at their job. Uh, so yeah, I think a lot of woke, bad wokeness is a skill issue. They're never, they're never put to the test. No one ever gives them the right feedback. There's no skin in the game for any of them. So they just never improve what they're doing ever. Um, they also just don't do the work. They get the job before they've ever done the work required to have the job. You get this with comics. Like people who've never written anything get a comics writing job and lo and behold, the comics come out and they're terrible. And then they get promoted. They keep getting work on, they, they fail upwards uh, because of like woke politics. It's like, it's so stupid. And all of this predates ESG, by the way, guys. People are worried about these like, you know, these social credit scores, these ESG funds. All of this predates it by decades really this stuff was a problem at the university system when i last taught at a university which at this point was more than 15 years ago um i wonder how sylvester sloan was able to write so well from the beginning rocky was his first screenplay uh he probably had people helping him edit it and he also just probably practiced before that too that rocky was probably not the first thing he'd ever written uh in his whole life he probably oh, i'm gonna take up story right now but it probably went through a lot of revisions and things like that you know had good feedback. Rocky did turn out pretty good, but uh, there's probably a lot of other things. That was his first screenplay produced. There was probably a lot of other things he wrote before that. Also, time periods affect how people talk and behave. They can, yeah, but and you, when you, most of the time when you're reading fantasy, you're you're still operating mostly in modern vernacular. You're not you're not going to read things in like 18th century dialects most of the time. If you want to be really period accurate, you can, like a movie like Rob Roy. Um, has like some period specific uh, talking, I guess, uh, which some people are like, I can't understand what they're saying. You have to kind of, same thing with reading Shakespeare or, or really you should watch Shakespeare. You watch Shakespeare, you're going to hear people doing early modern English, maybe with an early modern pronunciation if they're really good. And you'd be like, I oh, don't understand it. Yeah, it's because, you know, there's a time barrier there. So most of the time you want to write in the... Um, in the vernacular of the person who's going to read it. So I guess this is the bigger point. Language is a communicative medium. And I point this out because rebelling against the language is not something I advise people to do. It's something that's outside of you. So the reader has a knowledge of English, supposedly. You would like to communicate something to him. You should probably use the language which he already knows and not use a lot of language that he wouldn't know. 
not use formatting that's bizarre or strange in order to confound him. You would do it in as, as clear as, as possible. That's why I say keep it simple, stupid. Same thing with dialogue. You don't need to say, you don't need to use a bunch of similes when someone is speaking. People don't speak in similes. Like it's like reading half a Shakespeare thing and hearing those similes and saying that's the way people should talk. Uh, for a modern audience, you wanna keep it pretty simple. Uh, the point of the, the dialogue is to communicate the feelings of the characters and to move the story along, you know. Is there a cat in the background? Yes, he's wandering around somewhere. You know. Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon is horrendous. Constant exposition dumps around every corner is mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, people can make bad decisions even if they've been doing stuff for a while. I, you know, it happens all the time. I like how Mark Twain wrote the dialogue for The Prince and the Pauper in Medieval English. I have to look at it. That could actually hamper like your ability to read it depending on how it's written. But Mark Twain was also well read. So he can write things. So when you say medieval English, I'm assuming you mean early modern. Medieval English would be like Anglo-Saxon or Middle English maybe. You know, if you're talking high Middle Ages or late medieval, then you're at Middle English. Middle English doesn't really, it kind of sounds like English. It sounds like somebody almost speaking English. That's the best way to describe it. Dutch sounds that way too to me. It's like Dutch sounds like someone speaking English and German at the same time. You're like, I understand you kind of. <laughs> um, I understand. I think I understand, but it sounds silly. <laughs> Uh, I watched The King the other day, which is an adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry V. Surprisingly good, but definitely recommend it. So glad I finally managed to catch one of these streams live. What soda is best for writers to drink? <sighs> I'm drinking cherry limeade. I'll just grab this out of the out of the fridge. I like this cherry limeade. It's good. Um, I have like a soda stream, and I make Diet Pepsi with it, or Pepsi Zero drink that sometimes um i prefer coke zero but i was getting annoyed buying cans and like recycling the cans you're kind of incentivized to just throw away cans in texas which kind of sucks but, like i turned in all the cans and got like no money <laughs> i was like oh this is kind of not even worth my time um so let me just avoid the cans and i'll just use reuse bottles and stuff you know so that's what i do um, for that sample uh, out to this time of night again and hast not brought a farthing home I warrant me if it be so and I do not break all the bones in thy lean body then I am not John Canty but some other yeah that's um, kind of pseudo early modern that's what I call that I wouldn't call that medieval medieval English um, like we'll just look up Canterbury Tales Let's just look up the text. When April's dirty suit has pierced to the root. Right. Um, Middle English. We'll take a look at it. Because Middle English, it's like, whoa, this is not English. <laughs> um, Where is it? Yeah, let's look at it. This is not the beginning I remember, but anyway. <laughs> Here's the general prologue. With the translation. This is good. I guess this is from Harvard. Let's take a look. Boop, boop, boop. I like lights me from below like I'm somewhat sinister. Uh, one that April with his short suit, the draught of March hath pierced to the root, and bathed every vein in sweet, in sweet liqueur, of which vertu engendered is the flower, when Zephyrus eke with his sweet breath. This is actual medieval English, right? Most people would hear this and be like, I don't understand it. I don't even really know how to pronounce it. I've heard people like, I've, I remember lectures on like, here's how you pronounce Middle English. And I'm like, this is a little beyond me, <laughs> you know. But this is cool. This has a good little trend. I mean, April with its sweet smelling shower. So it's Shures, showers, Shures suit, right? 
Sweet. The draught of March hath pierced to the root, and bathed every vein in sweet liqueur, of which vertu engendered is the flower. Notice they misspelled, they spell flower differently. When Zephyrus eke with his sweet breath, Zephyrus, I guess, is the west wind, right? Inspired hath in every holt and heath. Now, you could write dialogue like this. This would be a very postmodern thing to do. Mark Twain, um, in terms of his period, he's really in the early modern, right? We call early modern English is like Shakespearean. That's early modern. It's, it's English. Um, whereas Twain is like early modern, you know, a little bit before the 20th century. Um, Bram Stoker would be early modern as well. So it's not totally, you, you don't get like a whole big pursuit of weird aesthetics and structures like you get later on with like James Joyce or someone like that. But um, you will get a lot of flavors that are kind of unique in the late 19th century. So Mark Twain was pretty good at that. So I would call, I would call it Mark Twain was doing like a early modern dialect um, that's intended to sound maybe 18th century, 17th century maybe, you know? Versus like Middle English. Now you could, like this would be a very postmodern thing is like, let's write a book in Middle English and like actually do that. Um, do people read Middle English? No, it would be a weird experience. They'd have to, you, you, you know, the whole point would be to create a strange reading experience for a reader to force them to read something in a different language that's familiar and yet unfamiliar, um, you know. Be like writing a modern book in latin that was something that you could do the postmodern approach to it would be like i'm going to write it in latin so that people have to learn a new language to read it you know it'd be kind of a weird way kind of a weird way to do it um yeah how important is it to read books on history and myths and legends can they be a useful source of inspiration i think it's very important so if you're picking uh one thing wine or fanta is my writing go-to i don't uh, i don't ever drink alcohol almost ever anyway but i just drink this is close to Fanta, right? Um, so if you're going to study one other thing besides writing uh, as a writer, I would recommend history and mythology. Oh, well, I guess those are two, two things. Uh, history. Then mythology. History will expose you to... It's not just facts. It's how people lived. It's what they thought. It's what they believed in. It's what they died for. It's the political organizations that they um, that they used, how they were used, what the results of those were. So when you're making fictional worlds, all of those things come into play. You get an idea of what the medieval mindset was or the ancient Roman mindset, how a Roman viewed things, what Romans were trying to do with their political system. Um, and... Yeah, it's just really, really valuable. Mythology is also valuable because one of the main, um, I don't know, I don't want to call it a mistake. It's just a, a limitation of a lot of anybody in the West, including me. Your default frame of reference is a what I call post-Protestant. Um, so, you know, we have a, a Christian reference and then we have the Reformation and it's mostly Protestants who settle America, and they have a Protestant mindset. They have a different view of religion from Catholics and Orthodox practitioners. So they have a little bit different mindset. And then what we have now is a secularized post-Protestant mindset. So you're still looking at things through a Protestant frame. You're looking at things through a Christian frame. Um, and that means it's going to be really hard to understand, for instance what people thought about Zeus. <laughs> Here's all these myths about this, like, not a good guy. I mean, my son and I were studying some of the myths. He's like, Zeus is not like a good guy. I'm like, no, he's actually pretty bad. It's like, why was he like worshiped? It's like, because you didn't want to be on the bad side of, of Zeus or he'd strike you with a, a thunderbolt. The religion of the ancients was not about being good or bad. It was about being in the right relationship with the gods so that they didn't smite you with floods and things like that, you know. Um, it, was a, it was a lot more transactional. Um, not that Christianity is non-transactional, but it's more like we do this so that the favor of the gods falls upon us and they'll do things for us 
and we certainly don't want to anger the gods or they'll smite us and kill us right it was a different like you had a state obligation to participate in sacrifices to jupiter because if you lost the favor of jupiter rome would be destroyed it's a totally different mindset so being able to study history and mythology to step outside of our current modern view where everything's secular uh, religion is something that's not um universal between people uh we don't share the same mindsets about religion um religion is a thing that people do on sunday and uh don't do it maybe during the week right to something where like people are you know there's a god of the door hinges you know to go to to properly build a door you have to honor like three gods you know there there's like janus the god of the doorway um, that the month of january is named after and then there's like a god of the door hinges and there's a god of locks and then there's a god of thresholds and there's a god of the house like uh, hestia or um you know uh, vestia or or any of these kind of goddesses that are, have to do with the home so there might be five six gods you have to do before you can put a door in Right, you like to acknowledge them, pray to them, maybe light some incense in their honor, and evoke them for good blessings upon the doorway. Right, this stuff that permeated everything that you did in life in the pagan world has kind of been lost to us in the modern frame. We don't get it. Uh, same thing. I see people, modern, a lot of modern atheists get into a syncretic mindset where they are thinking, okay, uh, they, they like you hear Judeo-Christian. Judeo-Christian is a stupid word <laughs> it's like well you know um the bible the the old testament is jewish therefore like obviously jews and christians are basically the same thing it's like they don't worship the same god right christians worship the holy trinity uh they don't worship some abstract yahweh that hasn't incarnated and been with them uh the moral implications are totally different between the two the purposes of uh, law are different between them the way you treat outside everything's different right it's a very different thing um so you get into a very syncretic notion where you're like well you know because they shared the same text they're they're worshiping the same god the ancients engaged in syncretism on a state level they're like okay your god is is basically the same as jupiter right yeah okay he's tier he's a sky god we're going to call him tier jupiter and we're going to honor Tyr and Jupiter at the same time, just in case they're two separate gods. And then you might have a, a Jupiter in your house, which was not the same Jupiter as Jupiter Optimus Maximus in the temple. He might be a different Jupiter. He might be praying to, and you kind of get this in the Bible where it's like they have idols, Baals and Ashtaroths, plural. What do you mean? Baal? Is it Baal just Baal? Maybe not. Maybe not to the ancients. To the ancients, their Baal that they call Baal might be different than their neighbor tribes Baal, which they also call Baal. Right. So the syncretism the Romans kind of dished out is something moderns take up to try to draw connections. It's like, where did they get this God and why did they associate this stuff? It's because ancient syncretism, they would syncretize their gods. They would take on foreign gods. The Romans were specifically there to say they're all the same gods, but also maybe not. Right. You know, so getting into that pagan mindset is really hard. And just getting out of the modern mindset, let's say you're going to write something in medieval England. That's pre-Reformation. You have to think about how people thought about their religion in the 14th century. It's going to be radically different than you think of your religion. Chances are, even if you're Catholic, the, a 14th century Catholic, uh, which back then was just Christian, right? Uh, as far as people in the West were concerned. Uh, he's probably going to think about everything different from you and that's fine so you have to kind of study that history and study that mythology and study that folklore to get into that mindset and then when you're writing fiction when you're constructing new things they they're not really constructing new things rather you're building with the old things and understanding how those things work okay i'm going to design a new place um they're going to need gods uh they're going to want to have a relationship with the gods that that allows them to be prosperous and fruitful um, and they're going to perform sacrifices and rituals for those gods. And there's going to be rituals for marriage uh, to ensure that the gods bless the marriage. Uh, we're also going to need like maybe stories. They're going to tell stories around the campfire. They might have some legendary heroes they have to talk about. Um, 
might have music that does this. They're going to do this, uh, these festivals during the year associated with these seasonal changes. They're going to um, do this when they eat. Maybe they, you know, you can just come up with a cool ritual. It's like, oh, uh, you cut the fat off your steak and you throw it into this one place where all the fat from the steak is thrown as an offering for like some sort of hungry undead god, right? It's like, well, that's weird. Ancients did this kind of stuff all the time. The Norse believed that uh, Odin's son, I think it's, is it Vili? No. Mm, Vidar. He would kill um, Fenrir. And he would step on Fenrir's jaw with a boot that was impenetrable because it had been made up of all the scraps of leather that had been shaved off of all the boots through all the many centuries. So when you shaved off the leather of your boot and you're Scandinavian, that scrap of leather is an offering to a god. Weird. It's not part of our mindset, but it's all bound up in their mythology that like these things are for the gods and the, you know, hanging criminals is an offering to Odin, right? A human sacrifice. These are all weird things, right? They're outside of our normal wheelhouse. So studying the history really helps you to get outside of uh, putting modern people in a fantasy setting. And I, I've seen it so much, right? Like Wheel of Time, which is a good series, does this to a great extent. It's modern people in a fantasy setting rather than fantasy people. I mean, Tolkien does this to an extent. The Hobbits are basically modern English people running through ancient times. It's a way to, it's a way to look at it. Um, So glad I finally managed to catch one of these. Well, thanks for stopping by, Film Girl. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so important to read history. So my little rant is like helps you step out of your mindset. We're all born with this basic like Christian mindset. All of our morality, you notice, when people talk about good and bad, they're always doing virtue ethics. <laughs> They may want to, you know, unless you're doing somebody who's like really into like abstract philosophy or like constructing new ethical systems, the default view for people is just Christian virtue ethics, right? Did you do something selfishly just for yourself and it hurt someone else? That's bad. It's like, but under other ethical systems that were pre-Christian, there wasn't anything bad about that. It's just what people did. You know what I mean? So, if there were some government programs that artificially placed $1 bounties on recyclables, that might be a better waste of money than half the stuff the government already does. So, California kind of does that. Um, so, when you go buy something in California, there's a tax on it. And you only can get a portion of the tax back by recycling the can. But the place that recycles the can doesn't actually give you that back. So, it's just an extra tax. Um, but you do get more for your recyclables because that ends up being a subsidy for all the recycle places. The Prince of the Pauper set in 1537. That's probably good dialogue for 1537. It's still very modern to me. It doesn't it it doesn't sound like Shakespeare, which is um, around 15 around 1600. Um, so it's accessible, but it has a good flavor. It has a flavor of early modern to give you the idea that yeah, it's like a 16th century 16th century something. So yeah, I think it works good. But um, you, Mark Twain, so here's the thing, right? It's like Mark Twain did this. Okay, but Mark Twain was really well-versed in literature. So if you wanna do that, I'm not saying you can't do that. I would caution most people not to do it because most people are gonna expect something that's closer to modern vernacular. Um, and I, that's what I do with my fantasy books. I try to keep my dialogue fairly straightforward and easy to understand. Go back and read a lot of that stuff, read Shakespeare, you can read Milton, like just, you know, read older stuff, even read 18th century stuff. And uh, that'll give you an idea of maybe the little bit differences that they did with pronunciation as well as how they used the language back then. Um, kind of oddly enough, this reminds me that uh, I think it was Patrick Stewart pointed this out. It's like people, people didn't like the fact that Kevin Costner spoke with an American accent in um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which was a movie that came out when I was a kid. Uh, so Kevin Costner was was um, just speaking in an American accent. People, this is dumb. Now they actually began shooting it, and he had this weird kind of Cockney country accent, and it didn't. They they looked at it on screen, they're like, we can't do this. 
we got to reshoot this. Just talk like you normally talk. And Patrick Stewart was like, that's how people actually talked back then, is that they used a hard R. The hard R was pretty standard for a long time, and then the hard R kind of got abandoned at some point. So really, um, if you were to listen to Shakespeare, and I've heard several good reconstructions of kind of early modern pronunciation, the R's are pronounced. Early modern is closer to American English than it is to modern English English, just because of a bunch of weird linguistic trends and, and talking trends that happen um, that create accents, you know, so the hard R kind of went away, except for people who were uh, kind of pagunus, you know, the, out in the country, the country bumpkins. Oh, what are you, his bodyguard? Miss Gardner. Samwise has a hard R indicating he's from the country. Miss Gardner. That's pretty close to American English. Gardner. 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 Gor There's just a little bit of a change of the palate to say like Gardner instead of Gardner. It's very close. A hard R. You know what I mean? Anyway. <laughs> Odyssey is difficult to understand. It's really difficult to understand in, in ancient Greek. <laughs> a Odyssey, so the Odyssey is challenging, right? Reading the Odyssey can be challenging on twofold. Number one is um, you are probably not reading it in ancient Greek and you're not an ancient Greek linguist, right? So reading it in some form of archaic Greek is going to be difficult, even if you know modern Greek. <laughs> uh, this is something I found out with like um, certain Greek Orthodox churches will do their, um, do their divine liturgy in like medieval Greek. They still do it in medieval Greek, kind of like the Latin mass, but it's medieval Greek. And it's like, you can speak modern Greek and go to the medieval Greek uh, divine liturgy and be like, I don't understand anything. <laughs> you know, they, there's like, I understand some of the words, but they, they're weird, like they're in the wrong order. And, you know, um, and even though ancient Greek is closer to modern Greek, you're still, there's a language barrier there. So you have to figure out like, somebody who's an expert has to help you with the translation and then it's a poem and so it's constructed in a certain way that's not designed to just give you a clear narrative the way prose is so odyssey can be very challenging it's totally worth it though you know uh, i think it's great to read and not fully knowing the nature of god doesn't mean worshiping a different god jews of the non-messianic variety don't get the full picture but are not worshiping a separate deity they don't worship the trinity so they're not worshiping the same god See, and this is something that a, plenty of theologians have tackled in the past. I'm not, I'm not trying to like be hard against you or anything like that. Um, but it's a modern idea. This is a modern syncretic idea that Jews, Muslims, and Christians are just like different. They're just all worshiping the same God. It's like, well, the same God requires different things. The same God is not of the same concept, right? The Holy Trinity versus um, not that, right? Requires different things of the people. Uh, requires different things for salvation, requires different things, um, different rituals, uh, even sometimes different names, right? So you get overly syncretic and start to think that like, it's like Judeo-Christian values. It's like, mm, I think we mean Christian values, but we're just trying to be inclusive, you know? So what really shaped the West wasn't like the minuscule number of Jews that happened to be living in it, but the dominant religion, which was Christianity. And before that, the dominant religions, which were pagan religions. We really can't underwrite like the, the um, Hellenistic force that has infused the West, including Christianity. Christianity is, you know, the reason the New Testament was written in Greek and the reason the original Old Testament was based on the Septuagint, which was a a Greek translation of the Old Testament, um, right? Why was it in Greek? It's because even the Jews, the bigger diaspora of Jews were, were Hellenized. They spoke Greek and not Hebrew um, a lot in the first century. Yeah. So anyway, I just think it's a little too syncretic to be like, oh, they're, they're all the same. It's like, do they worship the same God when they don't call it the same names? It has a, it's a different concept of God. They have different relationships with the God, different rituals. Right, the ancients would say those aren't the same God. They'd be like, "Oh yeah, this this Yahweh is different, obviously, than Jesus." Right. 
I had a teacher who claimed ancients were self-worshippers. What is your theory? I don't think they're self-worshippers. That's a weird thing. I don't know what you mean by self-worshippers. I mean, in an animistic sense, there's people who would say, like, I worship God and God is still in me, maybe. Like, I'm a portion of God. I don't know. I don't really think... I don't... I'd have to know what the heck self-worship means for ancients. Like, what do you mean they worship themselves? Now, they had private religions. Greeks had their own family special religions that they... Everybody was in, like, a private cult. There were many secret cults, uh, esoteric cults. I don't think they were self-worship, though. What do you think about Christopher Nolan as a screenwriter and a storyteller? Uh, generally, I think he's good. I haven't watched every Christopher Nolan movie out there, though. So, uh, But there's when we're talking about movies, there's a more to r making the movie than, quote, writing. Like, writing is a more expansive thing. You're designing sets and you're managing how something is shot and that because that's a communicative medium is showing showing things, right? There's so much more that goes into a movie besides the dialogue, but the dialogue can really tank it. You know, I don't think Christopher Nolan has bad dialogue. I think he has pretty good dialogue, but I'm not I'm not sure. I have to look up credits. I'm not sure like things he directed and also wrote or what or what the what that is. I don't remember all the credits from every movie he's done. Hello, everyone. Quick question. Is All Shafal a standalone book? It is, sort of. Yes. You can read it as a standalone. It, um, yeah. It's technically a follow-up to Crown of Sight. So, Crown of Sight, Al Shafal that comes after that. You could read either one separately, and they're fine. You don't really have to read one to understand the other. It's different characters for the most part. There's one character in common between Al Shafalda and Crown of Sight. Um, he's the general um, Mardrell, Elven general. You meet him. But otherwise, there's no no other characters in common. It's a different story. Very different kind of story, too. It's, it's like a tragedy. Very different kind of story. Um... Anyone who rejects Christ is not worshiping the God of Christianity. Simple as. Yeah, this is, I mean, this, theologians talked about this a lot. Like the the point of tolerance towards Judaism was really recognizing like a common background. The same reason that there was, you know, tolerance towards anyone um, back then. Jews were not like considered, like they, they were ghettoized even back in the medieval period. Um it wasn't like a new thing that developed in the 20th century. It's like a very long thing. They were, they were like outsiders, right? Um, and then they, the amount of tolerance you had towards Jews varied, right? Uh, they were all expelled from England and they were all expelled from Spain at different times. Because they didn't view them as worshiping the correct God. They were heretics, right? They viewed them as, it was a heretic, right? They treated them the same way. So yeah, I don't, I don't take this in credit position where like, uh, and, and, and people have, have got upset about this when I say like, um, when I talk about American religion and I say, you know, um, Adventism is a, is a religion and they're like, well, no, it's Christianity. I'm like, well, it's pretty different from different forms of like Christianity itself is a big umbrella term that, that encompasses a lot of different approaches to faith that we might really consider different religions, even if they are trying to point towards the same, the same deity. But, you know, Adventists have like a, a very different belief system, maybe, right? Or Mormons, right? These, these different little sects that popped up in the 19th century in the United States are really interesting to study. I don't, and I'm not trying to like denigrate anybody. Um, but like when I see them, it's like, okay, I can see some of the commonality, but they're very different, right? I would consider them a different religion uh, from, say, Baptist, right? Like Baptists and Mormons are different religions to me. Um, Adventists and Baptists, even though they're closer, like, you know, Baptists, Mormons, far apart. Adventists are a little closer, right? This, I would still consider them different religions. Same thing with like Shakers, Quakers. Uh, what else am I thinking of? Like lots of these uh, um, American religions that popped up that were a little different, you know, different sects, I guess, of Christianity 
um, since there's no kind of overarching structure to prevent people from doing that like there was in the Middle Ages. And kind, of, kind of free country, people would just kind of form their own little churches and their own religious ideas. And they had things that started, like the Adventist movement started as like a Bible study, like almost like a letter, like a letter writing group. <laughs> I don't know how to de describe it. And then it developed into, by the 1840s, there was a, a concrete prediction that Christ was coming back on like 1841. And then there was a thing called the Great Disappointment where Christ didn't come back. And so all of these Adventists who'd been preaching, like we're about to see the second coming of Christ, had to take a step back and be like, uh, we were wrong. Uh, but a lot of it reformed into what we would now recognize as the Adventist movement, including Seventh-day Adventists, um, who have, I'm trying to remember her name. I just forgot her name as I started talking about it. it proves that I'm not an expert. Uh, but they ended up with a, a prophet, you know, who wrote new documents that were, say, on close footing to speak to scripture, whereas Mormons wrote new documents that were scripture to them. Uh, so they went to another level again. I consider these different religions, right? Then say mainline Protestantism, radical Protestantism, which would be Baptists and uh, Catholicism, especially. So you can look at all the different branches of Christianity, like Shiites and Sunni Muslims often don't even consider each other Muslims. They don't recognize each other as Muslims. This was like a big deal when like uh, there was a Sunni Muslim group recognized like Nation of Islam as fellow Muslims because they're like, you're not worshiping Allah because you're not doing it right. It's a different religion. They viewed it as a different religion. The modern, again, like I think partly when I talk about like the, the Protestant mindset or maybe the post-Protestant mindset, I call it post-Protestant because I think the, the secular culture has sort of evolved out of the general Protestant mindset, but has kept a lot of those things, Christian virtue ethics, um, like general, uh, you know, general belief in God and things like that. There's a comfortable tension between all these different religions in America because of the way that our country was formed and our First Amendment protections and things like that. So... Uh, people play nice with each other. They are really quick to be syncretic and recognize what we have in common and just let's be in separate buildings because of what we don't have in common. And that's okay for a secular society. And that's the only way that our society functions is that we have a syncretic mindset about Christianity. Uh, before it was, before we really had a lot of real religious diversity, like really different religions like Buddhists, um, it was all different versions of Christianity, and so you just had to have a comfortable live and let live attitude between them, recognize each other as fellow believers, and not dig too deep into um, the theology that maybe is backing some of these things up. You know what I mean? So, go on that. Way. That's not to disparage anybody. It's just to point out that like things are really different. You know, um, a Roman would definitely consider the Mormon conception, which is non-trinitarian, as being very different. Like probably understand Mormonism a lot more than they would understand um, like orthodoxy, for instance. Um, they'd be, this is weird, like, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you got it. There's like a sky god, Elohim, and then he has um, some kids. That there's, a, there's a bad god and a good god, and yeah. And then everybody's going to be deified. That's interesting. That's cool. Maybe I could join your cult, and maybe I could be deified too, you know? I don't know shit. <laughs> you know, uh, I always got to try to do more because um, there's always so much more to understand. The cult of Dionysus, boy, you want to talk about a weird cult? <laughs> it's like they would go out and transform a deer into their god and then eat it. You know, <laughs> kill it and eat it. It's like he is. We're eating our god, right? And then the Christians have this. Oh, oh, that's weird. Maybe Dionysus and Christianity are the same. No, they're not, right? So people are like, oh, you know, the worship of Virgin Mary. People don't worship Virgin Mary. Uh, the worship of Mary is just a, from Egypt. You know, they just transferred Isis onto Mary. I'm like, well, they're both female. Like, both of these figures are female. I have the, I have the little, uh, what's the icon? I have the icon everybody likes. I need to put it back up.
Zeus as worse than them.
Um, man, I'm sorry. Yeah. So you missed that whole rant. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Sorry. <laughs> Giving this epic talk, we're all missing it. I have no idea where my my microphone cable fell out. I bumped it with my hand. I have to have this weird microphone position because of this giant monitor I have. Everything's a little weird um, compared to my old setup, so I'm still figuring it out. I maybe still would set up the microphone to like come over the top. Again, that was really convenient. So I may figure out a way to do that. But I don't know. I haven't figured it out. Maybe get like a boom stand and just like, hey, you can't even see this mic anymore. It's like this arm messing up the frame. I don't like it. Anyway, let me check out the chat and I'll just respond to chat because I went on this whole thing about all these different religions, right? And how they, uh, some, some Asian American religions started by a charismatic leader. It falls apart. It gets resurrected by another charismatic leader who then helps it to carry on and refine its vision, and then it regresses to the mean of general Protestantism. So Adventism did this. It was William Miller, and then um, the Great Disappointment happened, got reformed by Ellen White, and then it kind of regressed into the general sort of Protestant area where people are like, oh, Adventists are just Christians that go to church on Saturday. And they go to church on Saturday because of like prophetic visions though and that's a little bit different than what most mainline protestants would think of so a little different right same thing with mormons joseph smith had a really novel bunch of novel what we called heterodox beliefs heresies right bunch of novel beliefs polygamy you know this um you know uh pre-existence of souls and a cosmology that involves those pre-existing souls where there was like a fight between pre-existing souls like there's a, a whole just like new set of mythology that gets attached to Mormonism. Joseph Smith gets murdered in prison or in jail, and then it gets reformed by Brigham Young. And then over time, it sort of regresses to the Protestant mean to where Mitt Romney is not really that different from George W. Bush. Like you can't really think of Mitt Romney as being having profoundly different moral vision than George W. Bush, or even being like religiously super different, even though he would be a Mormon, right? It's like, yeah, he's just, uh, he's a little bit different religion, you know, he's still good, basic virtue ethics, yada, 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 right? You still inherit the, you know, they, they kind of regress into the, the Protestant meme. All right, let me take a look at some of the chat. I'm sorry that the audio cut out. It's my bad. Do, 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 do. Um... Cable came out. True Blood Season 2 had a whole cult of Dionysus storyline. Creepy. Yeah. If you look up the original. I mean, that's a great piece of inspiration. Like, if you want to write a weird cult, you can write. I mean, and look at some of the native religions of, like, like the native practices of, like, Australoids, like um, um, native Australians, Aboriginal Australians, and... Uh, you know, there, were, there was cannibal cults. There's all kinds of weird cults. Like the Aztecs were really extreme, but they were extreme because they made an empire out of their bizarre cannibal cults. Um, whereas uh, there was lots of weird demonic religions like that all over the world. Um, I have definitely heard Protestants espouse the ancient cult theory regarding Mary. Pretty cringe. Yeah, they just you get involved in whatever will justify your current belief. That's, and I'm I'm not trying to, like, dog on them, but it's like uh, nobody really considered this in the Reformation. For instance, the perpetual virginity of Mary was never debated. That was like always assumed. Um, that's a kind of a modern thing. Uh, but there's lots of people who they want a narrative that kind of explains the history. Everybody makes a mythology about themselves. And so um, any anybody's going to make a mythology about like, well, where were the Baptists in the third century? Well, they were like in hiding or something, right? I've heard Baptist preachers like say things like that. It's a little weird to me and kind of cringy rather than just saying like, well, we we believe this <laughs> and we believe it based on these theologians that said these things.
Yeah, sorry about the chat. Sometimes the chat stops and then I get a bunch of chat because I'm looking at it on Restream. You know, you don't want to get too syncretic about anything, right? When you're talking about these people's beliefs being the same. It's a danger with comparative mythologies that we make too much of the compare part and not enough of the contrast. Super chat. Thank you for the super chat. Audio keeps cutting out. Cables loose. The super chat doesn't pop up on on um, Restream either, so I apologize for that, but I do thank you for the super chat. Um, that face, we just missed an incredible theological connection between all modern religions. The theological connection of American religions is like that cycle that I talked about. A really, and we see it with um, the kind of mega churches. Uh, mega churches have this too. Really charismatic leader starts a mega church, it grows, and then it something causes it to fall apart, and it gets reformed, kind of in a smaller, like by someone else, and then um, kind of regresses to be not as not as radical as it was. Right? Radical radical ideas really excite people. We just missed him proving that God is real. What a shame. Atheist one. <laughs> I wish I could hear his wisdom. All right. It's it's, it's showing it as blinking on my on my screen now. So I had and the other thing is I had the audio monitor covered up by my by a different window. This is my fault. All right. Let's hopefully the the uh, the audio is caught back up. Live stream era should be required to look at the chat. The chat sometimes doesn't get it. Sometimes it doesn't flow and then it then it all goes. Uh, five chat. Thank you. For, see, what I should do is just cut out my audio and then I can get super chats. Thank you. The audio is completely gone. You're talking to the void for the past 10 minutes. Sorry. It's going to have to start his monologue all over again. I don't know what I was even talking about. Uh, I assume I was going on this thing about all the syn syncretism that goes on. I've received 100 messages. Thank you, Restream. Um, I don't see the thing is I can only see a couple messages at a time and I like to read them and respond to them and not move on until I get to the next thing that I'm talking about. So if I just went on an epic rant in response to like one chat that happens sometimes. Sorry. I like Ray Bradbury's idea of writing a short story every week. I do appreciate the super chats. They don't pop up on Restream though. Um, I have to go find them like on maybe on the YouTube. Maybe on the YouTube channel. I don't think I have monetization on either. I don't know why this defaults off. Yeah. So the super chats will, will pop up on this one. Can you talk about power systems and writing how power scaling works? All right, let's let's let me let me break that down a little bit and let's think about what it is. Um I don't know. Did you guys hear me before I go? Did you guys hear me say that it's better to be a man than to be a god? That the Greeks didn't did Zeus was not an image of a man. Zeus was worse than a man. I don't know if you guys heard me say that. All right. Uh, I recently did watch Virgin Territory, the 2007 film that was loosely based upon Giovanni um, Boccaccio's 14th century tale, uh, Decameron. They handed the old-fashioned talk quite well. All right. Power systems. How power scaling works. It sounds like a gaming question to me. So I'm not really sure how to like tackle this question. Like what a power system is. Like a magic system? And then how power scaling works. Like how somebody gets more powerful. So I tend to read a lot of classic fantasy and this is not usually an issue in classic fantasy. I think this is more a concern of a lot of modern writers who are trying to do a Sandersonian, quote, hard magic system. Some people call hard magic, which is going to be like, um, you know, allomancy, these 14 metals, and the 14 metals do these things. The copper does this, like really thinking it. So it's, it's basically like a Dungeons and Dragons system.
It's called Progressive Fantasy now. I didn't think I'd hear about power scaling outside of anime and manga. So yeah, if you're gonna write it like lit RPG, I would assume do, does this, but I can't stand that stuff. So uh, I don't read it. And if I see it in an anime, they've, they've, I've seen it in some animes. There was one that was called like, don't pick up girls in a dungeon and it's awful. Like it's just, I don't know how people watch this shit. Um, like this stuff doesn't belong in a story. I think it's like trying to take Dragon Ball Z to some other different level, right? So if you just look at Dragon Ball Z as an example, characters go out and get things which make them more powerful. They uncover latent powers they didn't know about which make them more powerful, which allows them to overcome the next challenge. If we look at Harry Potter, people learn uh, people learn spells, okay? So the spells make you more powerful. And so the kids in their first year are pretty weak. And by their seventh year, they're pretty strong because they've just learned more spells. They can do more stuff. They have more more, more, ma uh, more knowledge of magic. Um, and because that's a school story, that's a really good way to set it all up. So it's like, do, 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 do. You know, uh, I learned this and I learned this and I learned this. Oh, bad things happen. Why don't I learn my spell that someone taught me? Uh, and I can use it. So in Harry Potter, it does really well. Uh, just people learning different spells. You can think of it as like Legend of Zelda. You get items that let you do things, right? You get um, a magic sword. The magic sword makes you more powerful, which allows you to beat the bad guy who beat you up before. You go and you study the sword for six months from a sword master. This gives you the strength to beat up the guy who beat you up before, right? Um, this kind of growth that happens, uh, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, I think because I don't like this systematized Dungeons and Dragons style of like you gain strength, like your stats. So you have to look at what Dungeons and Dragons is trying to represent. Is that like D&D &D is representing what it would be like. All those stats represent an adventure getting stronger by carrying things getting better at fighting by having experience fighting so he gains experience then he gains stats and skills right just like how if you had a lot of experience fighting people you would get better at fighting people kind of like the whole point of this entire live stream which is about like writing development okay um, to develop as a writer you just have to practice it uh, any of those things finding tomes in dungeons that allow you to learn new spells and expand your mind because you're practicing your spellcraft as a wizard uh, putting the stats and stuff into the book or the anime or the manga or whatever is really dumb it's really dumb because it's like backwards the whole point is the character learns how to do something new by practicing <laughs> And then he can do that thing uh, versus like gaining, oh, you know, I'm turning in my, my card here. I th what was the one? Konitsuba? I watched, a, I watched a season of this one. I think it was Konitsuba. It has like Megamin, the little mage girl who's always blowing things up and passing out. You know, it's very silly because it treats it with zero reverence. So anime, I think, gets away with it. Whoa, there goes my camera. <laughs> Bonk the desk. There goes the camera. It's not my favorite camera. I actually need to get a new camera. Um, so anyway, yeah. Anime with like uh, portal fantasy, isekai, it skipped past the whole stage where they were serious about it and went right to, this is all a big freaking joke. And so the like magic systems in like Kanetsuba are just a joke. They're a joke. That's the whole point is they're supposed to be silly. Um, so they can get away with it more. But if you're actually trying to do it, think of like Star Wars. It's like you learn a skill, then you can do it. You show the character learning to do something. You show the character getting beaten up. He goes back and studies and gets stronger, right? There you go. That's my best answer that I can give for you. That the character has to do something to learn something new and, and better. 
And this isn't a problem with soft magic. You can do this with soft magic as well. Someone is mentioning soft magic in the chat. All right. Um, what's the problem with soft magic? There's no problem with soft magic. You just aren't being really super explicit about, you know, burning two ounces of copper inside your stomach to do a spell. Right. You're just going to go, okay, uh, I found this invocation for the water gods and I'm going to use it to evoke the water gods, Michael Moorcock style. That'd be soft magic. Or more likely, you just don't have the main characters, no magic, and wizards are kind of on the periphery. That's probably good as well. Hard magic avoids the issue of the audience asking, well, why couldn't they just solve X with a spell? Yeah, uh, it can, but it can also be like the writer can sometimes forget that they could do that, you know? So it's, but the thing is, is like, is the magic system interesting enough for you to bother explaining it? Sanderson can do a good enough job with it that he can get away with it. But I think a lot of writers really can't. Um, this is another thing about developing writers is that they focus on things like magic systems and they should focus on things like characters and plot. Uh, because if your magic system is half baked, but your characters are awesome and your plot kicks ass, nobody's going to care that you didn't have some sort of allomancy correct sort of thing going on. You know, uh, people forgive Brandon Sanderson because he has the, he has like crystals as money in this is terrible money, but people don't even care because they don't think that much about it. There's like, okay, crystals are money and this book rocks and they just don't even think about it. So if you're doing a good job on the main stuff of the story, you don't really need to worry about, is my magic system fine enough? Did I did I detail the geography hard enough? Like, no, it, it's a drama. Ultimately, it's a drama about characters. The geography doesn't matter as much as the drama between the characters and what they're trying to accomplish. You know, so that's my best answer that I can give you is that have the character has to do something to get more powerful. He has to go to Yoda, right? Look at all the examples that we have, and you could probably come up with a really good way of like having a character get more powerful to accomplish a goal. It's really common use. If it's not get more powerful, it's like find some magical talisman that will let me fix it. Get a better gun, build a better ship. You know what I mean? I find that uh, using overt RPG video games mechanics in your lore only works if you're going for humor. Yeah, I agree. I'd probably agree with that. Yeah, I can finally hop on the stream. Thank you. Uh, it's almost like all the novelists are frustrated tabletop RPG designers and all the tabletop RPG designers are frustrated novelists. That's an interesting way of thinking of it. Yeah, I said this before. More people should just... Um, more people should just do what they're excited to do. There's a lot of people trying to put their novel into a D&D &D campaign. And there's a lot of people trying to put a D&D a, a D &D game that they'd like to play with their bros into a book. Just separate those out. So instead of trying to force your players to do a campaign that you think is really cool with a necromancer, just write that as a book. Don't spend your time making game materials and that, just write a book and play a game. Um, and then if you are really wanting to design a game, design a game and get your friends to play it with you. Don't be like, well, you know, I really like D&D, &D, so, and I have this idea for a game. I'm going to write a book that has it in there. Now, there is some weird crossover. Like, apparently, um, like, a, a large portion of Malazan Book of the Fallen was designed with uh, like gameplay. It was designed with a GURPS campaign <laughs> and then got turned into like a, a novel and stuff later. So you can go from one to the other. I'm not going to say you can't ever, but a lot of times you have to think about what do you really want to do? Do you want to make a game or do you want to write a novel? Right. Like if I, I, I would really like to make a game at some point. I have way too many things on my backlog that I got to clear out like books that I haven't finished. So I would, you know, I'd love to finish those before, before I get into like a totally different medium. 
But if I do a game, I would really like it to make sense in the medium. Even if it's a visual novel, like there's choices or something that make sense in that medium. Rather than, how do I turn my, someone, I think my wife was like, well, why did you turn like Muramasa into one of these? People would love that. I'm like, people would love that, except it would probably not be that good because Muramasa is already a novel with like a set plot and everything, you know. Kanasuba is a parody. That was the intent. The, the thing is, every Japanese portal fantasy is a parody. Can you find me one that's not? I can't find one that's not humorous. I can't find the patient zero. The, the original isekai that like took itself seriously, I don't know what it is. What is it? I don't know what it is. I, it's probably so old I forgot about it. But but like the the whole genre of isekai really quickly transitioned from Princess of Mars to this is all a big freaking joke. Let's have some fun. Businessman arise in another world. Middle aged businessman. I actually read that book. It was pretty funny, right? The magic system is a nice car, but the plot and characters is how you drive the car. It doesn't matter how nice your car you have if you're driving <laughs> if you're driving stinks. Yeah. Never watch solo leveling humor. No kid trapped in berserk like game. Um, solo leveling, no humor. Hmm. I feel like uh, one of the curses of being a creative is thinking about all the other creative projects that you can do instead of really focusing on the only one. Yeah, I'm cursed to do that. Um, and that's true. Uh, that's why I'm like, I got to finish up at least these couple books before I move and try to do something new and different. Like I'm ready to do it like spiritually, <laughs> ready to do new stuff, but I have I have projects that I feel like for spiritual reasons too, they just need to see the light of day. Yeah. Redo of healer. Re zero. Can Goblin Slayer be viewed as a parody? I don't know. I don't know. There's always a lot of humor with those though. Is Goblin Slayer an Isekai? I don't I didn't Goblin Slayer, is that an Isekai? I wouldn't call it a it's not an Isekai. Like I'm thinking of Isekai specifically, I guess, as a went really quickly into the parody I, I wouldn't call it a parody like it's not um it's not like a parody of something else like a parody of star wars or parody of a movie i think it's just a humorous take on it like they it's a parody of the of the genre itself if that makes sense it self parodies the genre record of lotus war it, i don't think that's an isekai though i'm thinking of isekai not just fantasy, like isekai. There's plenty of Japanese fantasy that takes itself seriously. I don't know what Dot Hacks is, though. Um, Record of Lotus War, I don't... Lodos War. It's Lodos, right? Not Lotus, Lodos. I have the DVDs. Lodos War, that's right. Yeah. So isekai is portal fantasy. It's like, we're going to arise in another world. We're going to another world. It's like Princess of Mars or Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, which is a Mark Twain book. Inuyasha could be called isekai. Maybe it could, yeah. Mm -hmm. I anyway, the point is, is that it's... It, like most isekai, it just doesn't take itself seriously. So it just does that stuff for fun because it's a chance for humor and things like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so at some point, they, it went really quickly. My, I guess my point is that I think it went really quickly from this is a genre to this genre is stupid. Let's make fun of it while also making things that are cool in the genre. I don't know. It's really hard to do. It's like the Dragon Force of stuff, right? It's like you can't take yourself too seriously to do it. You know, you can't take yourself too seriously to do it. I'm thinking of like Japanese isekai versus like, 
if we're talking patient zero of Western portal fantasy, it might be Celtic mythology, but I think it's probably Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, um, followed up by A Princess of Mars by uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. So if you want to look at the origins of the genre in the West, those are the books to read. Now, if you're wondering which one is better, Princess of Mars is much better in my opinion, but Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court has been copied and parodied so many times, it's probably worth reading. Um, even if um, even if you don't end up loving it, you'll at least know where it starts. You know, kidding King Arthur's Court. <laughs> yeah. Chronicles of Narnia is an isekai, right? Not Japanese, but yeah, it's portal fantasy. You go through a portal to another world. Um, there's certain tropes that the Japanese use a lot, which is like really for Mark Twain. Your knowledge of modern world helps you to overcome the challenges of the fantasy world. That's a really common trope that you see used. So in like the Japanese isekai space, they'll have a character that he know he's really good at RPGs, so he knows how to like game the system and like be ultra powerful, you know. Konatsuba, what's another one? I'm trying to think of another one. I watched like two episodes of another one and got like bored of it. He goes and he makes friends with the orcs and stuff instead of like the pretty elves. You know, it's just another kind of silly take on the same thing. Mushoko Tensai. Vision of Escaflown is straight faced. Okay. I don't haven't seen that, so I'll probably have to check it out. Anyway, yeah, anyway, that's my point. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong and like I'm just not seeing are there any like current isekai that aren't just bonkers silliness? <laughs> I think they speed run the, the whole like self parody thing. So sorry about the, the uh, mic cutting out earlier. Anyway, um the live right on Saturday finished the book. I wonder if there. I think I didn't finish saying everything I wanted to say about developing as a writer. The main thing is you have to do it. So how do you develop as a writer? Let me give you a couple of different ways that you can develop as a writer. Okay, first one is you have to practice. So you have to write every day. Set a word count goal. People will debate about this. Should I write for an hour? Try to set a word count goal. Try to write at the start 500 words a day. And whatever thing you feel like writing on. When you're starting out, it doesn't matter. Write 500 words a day. When that is easy, write 1,000 words a day. When that is easy, write as much as you have time to write. Okay? Write 1,000 words a day. While you're doing that, you should also be reading. You can read like a short story a day. You can read a short story every other week. And then read the novels that you're interested in. You should be reading every day something. I read a lot every day. It's spread out throughout the day in different ways on my phone or like an audio or uh, in a chair. There's lots of different places I read. It's very spread out for me. I don't have like a dedicated reading time, but you should be reading every day because that's showing you how other people are using your language and writing is how you're practicing that language. That's the most important thing. If you do that, you're going to end up being good eventually, whatever else I might say. Okay, that's the main one. I talk about this in the book. Set realistic and accomplishable goals. That means set small goals. I'm gonna write 500 words. You can accomplish that. I'm gonna write a 3,000 word short story. You can accomplish that. Don't sit down and be like, I'm gonna write 500 words a day of my 500,000 word epic fantasy. Try to start with something smaller. Something that you can actually reach the end of. And then as you develop experience, you can raise the bar and set bigger goals. Okay. You should periodically go back and look at the things which you have written that you've written before and evaluate them critically because your writing may stand out as rather cringy after you've had some time away from when you actually wrote it and understood your intent. You may realize that your intent was uncertain. What did I mean by this? I, I, I encounter this a lot. I'm like, what did I mean by this sentence? I need to I need to rewrite this sentence. Okay. I will tell you that you will get more development done by writing five things than by writing and revising one thing. 
in terms of time and investment. So this is this English teacher mentality that people have about you have to re revise something and rewrite it five times. That's bullshit. I don't rewrite. I will rewrite one sentence. You know, I will change and fix sentences, right? That's revision. Uh, I don't rewrite the whole thing from page one. If, if I were going to do that, I wouldn't bother. I, I would look at... If I felt like I was so bad at what I did, I had to rewrite things from page one, then I would look at a different profession because clearly I'm too bad at this to continue. But even so, right? Rather than spending all of your time revising one thing, you will get more work done by writing something new. So let's say you write a short story. Oh, I need to revise this and make sure it doesn't suck. Nah, just put it in a drawer, write another one, write another one, write another one, write another one. Just keep writing them. Okay, if you were to write the equivalent of like 10 short stories instead of revising one or two, you would have grown a lot more as a writer because each time you do it, you're iterating in a new way. You're doing new words. You're making yourself think about new ways to put the sentences together, new ways to do the plot, new characters, new ways for new things to speak. You're constantly subjecting yourself to new stimuli and new challenges. It's like, uh, and it's the same thing with music, right? And this has been controversial. I've had plenty of people who are established uh, say I'm I'm not correct for, for saying this, but you will learn more as a guitar player by learning five pieces mediocrely, let's say, versus learning one piece really well. You just will. I've tested it with students. I've tested it with me. Man, I remember like in graduate school, people were like, Stu, how do you know so much music? I'm like, I just practice it, right? I just practice new stuff all the time. If I like something, I put that in the practice routine. I would sight read. I would spend like 10 hours a week sight reading music. And then anything I found that I liked, I would just stick with it and practice it. And if something was in my repertoire I didn't like, I just dropped it. I just stopped practicing it. I already learned it. I already did the growth. Boom, time to move on. Like if you got out your Christopher Parkening book and you just sight read all the exercises and tried to figure out the fingerings for every exercise, you get more done as a player than like trying to perfect exercise number three or something, okay? So that's it. Writing more quantity will get you to the quality um, versus trying to revise the same thing over and over again. You Because you just need more chops. You need more reps before you're gonna be able to look at that and even know how to revise it to begin with. So write more right? Eight to 10 short stories a year is a great goal, especially if you can keep them short. This one I wrote on the live write is like 16,000, 15,000 words. So it's a little bit too long for to be a short story, but you know, write a few of those a year and boom, you will have grown a huge amount, right? It's the same thing. It's like practicing one piece. It's good to practice a piece and get it perfect. But at the same time, you'll probably start to develop better chops by doing a lot of sight reading. Are audiobooks a good substitute? I think they are. They're a little bit different than reading, but I think they're a good substitute. I do listen to audiobooks um, quite a bit while I'm doing chores and things like that. I like to listen to an audiobook. Um, but when I read a book, I find that I stop, I go back, I reread things, I jump around. I just read a book, especially a physical book. Physical books, I prefer way more than ebooks, and I'll probably always be that way. Right? Anyway. That's this. So anyway, guys, I think I'm starting to run out of time. Maybe next week I'll talk about revision because we have the um, we have this book that we worked on live, the live right book. So let's take a quick look at that. So here it is. Um, I need a title for it. So before I do a revision, I need to figure out a title and I need to make sure the beginning style matches the end style. I need to make sure details that are important at the end are introduced in the beginning and are clear in the beginning. And we'll kind of deal with that a little bit next week as we talk about revision. I'll do a live write. Either I'll start on revision of this on Saturday or we'll do... Uh, we'll start a new one. I'll do Live in the Pod and Eat Bugs Part 2 or something like that. And we'll do that on um, Saturday. Talk about revision. Revision's a good process to look at because there's a bunch of different ways you can do it and a bunch of different outcomes you can get from it, okay?
All right, I appreciate you guys. All right, yeah. This in the Count of Monte Cristo that way last year, and it was nice. Yeah, I prefer physical books, but you know, audiobooks help me to cram one more books, and it works good. So, anyway, guys, have a great one. I will see you all next time, and have a great, great day. <laughs>